Okay, hello and welcome back or welcome uh, for the first time. We're now at day three of Next Generation Central Banking. My name is Michael. I work for Finanzwende, a German civil society organization working on financial change or changing the financial system. Together with the Heinrich Böll Foundation, we are organizing this, this conference. And uh, yeah, I have the pleasure of welcome you, welcoming you all. And uh, I can see some of you are still logging in, but I would like to take the opportunity to um, introduce uh, our first debate of the day uh, with us, our um, Benjamin Brown, who is a political scientist and a political economist at the Max Planck Institute for Study of Societies in Cologne. And he has a background in yeah, uh, political science and economics published widely on central banks and has written a really brilliant report uh, for this conference. Welcome, Benjamin. And ah, there you are. <laughs> and then we have uh, Michal Hoffat from the, uh, he's the chief economist at the National Bank of Slovakia and holds a PhD in economics from the University of St. Andrews. Welcome, Michal. Okay, and uh, without further ado, we wanted to sort of use this session with a, um, in a quick um, speed format kind of a, a um, session. So we'll give Benjamin um, five minutes now at the beginning to share his thoughts on um, what central bank, what else central banks are doing um, beyond inflation and maybe um, have been doing for, for a while. And then uh, Michal will jump in and, and sort of share his view. And um, I will lean back a little and let you guys go back and forth as, uh, as quickly as you want. And um, yeah, we'll just try and have a, a lively kind of uh, conversation. And ideally, I don't even have to uh, do, do much at all. So yeah, um, Benjamin, feel free to start now. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Um, all right, the brief uh, for my paper was to write about central banking beyond inflation and for a conference titled Next Generation Central Banking. So in other words, really the big picture. Um, so I will try to make three big picture remarks. And in a sense, they provide some more, or they spell out the motivation and thinking behind my paper more than the details of the paper, which I then hope to be talking about more in the, in the discussion and the debate. So what will next generation central banking look like? People tend to ask central bankers about this quite naturally. Central bankers then tend to say, let us focus on price and if you insist price uh, financial stability, but the rest is not for us, you figure it out. So my first big picture point is that we should not necessarily ask central bankers about the future of central banking. It's of course slightly polemical, but let me uh, elaborate. When we think about the future of central banking, we first need to think about what kind of world we want. To be more specific, the questions we need to answer are three. What kind of world do we want to live in, first? Second, what kind of macro financial architecture is likely to support our efforts to get to that world? And then, and only then, three, what would central banking look like within such an architecture? And with such a goal. So let me take this provocation a little further still. This is a debate after all. When it comes to questions one and two, monetary policymakers and economists should be just one voice and one view among many. And this is em emphatically not because their intentions are bad in any way. It is because the design and purpose of the macrofinancial regime is a matter of the highest political order. So party manifestos and parliaments are the right place to have that discussion. Once the democratic process leads to a political decision to say, make low inflation the main goal of macroeconomic policy, as happened, for example, around 1980, at that point, you should by all means address the third question to central bankers. What can you do to bring down inflation? My second point is about why it is so important to make the future of central banking about the broader macro financial architecture and why history is so important here. And here the uh, enemy is institutional amnesia, uh, which um, uh, Leah Downey and I wrote a paper about before and which I also explain in this paper. So a collective forgetting of the fact that central bank independence and inflation targeting were specific in institutional solutions at a historically specific juncture. 
the macrofinancial regime of Bretton Woods assigned priority to the state's ability to create and allocate money and to sustain full employment. Private financial markets and central banks were subordinated. This hierarchy became reversed and Daniela Gabor in her uh, paper for this conference shows this beautifully um, and explains this beautifully. This hierarchy became reversed under the macrofinancial regime of inflation targeting, which subordinated public finance to the power of private finance to create and allocate money. And the result was what Leah and I have uh, uh, called the holy trinity of inflation targeting. Price stability as the primary goal of the central bank, central bank inflation uh, uh, independence as the institutional arrangement, and the short-term interest rate as the operational target. And this holy trinity was a great achievement. The point is that uh, its achievement consisted in curtailing the financial power of the state at a point when you know, a political a power configuration prevailed that wanted to curtail the fin financial power of the state and to control inflation and to allow for international capital mobility instead and to unleash private credit creation. Today, the situation many of us think is different. We are confronting giant environmental, economic and social challenges. Inflation is not among them, at least not first and foremost. So we, we may want to think about instituting a macrofinancial regime designed to increase the financial firepower of the state. My third and last point is about what I call the progressive dilemma. Um, conservatives have it easy. They oppose any repurposing of central banks. By contrast, progressives are of two minds. On the one hand, they've spoken out against the empowerment of un unelected central bankers, especially since 2008. And again, this is not um, uh, the fault of central bankers. This is in many cases, the fault of uh, politics and politicians. Um, on the other hand, we are calling for a reorientation of monetary policy towards green social purposes. I, uh, and Jens van Kloster, who will speak next, and many other people take the concern with excessive unelected power seriously. However, we do not call for a return to the Maastricht ideal of a narrow price stability obsessed European Central Bank. The reason is that this ideal has always been a fiction. The Central Bank always does a lot more than tinker with the short-term interest rate. And that's where strategic ignorance comes in, another uh, central um, concept in, in my contribution for the conference. And here I take my inspiration from Lindsay McGuire's work. Strategic ignorance is the fall insistence that central banks have only one instrument at their disposal and can therefore only pursue one goal. In reality, central banks, including the ECB, deploy a range of instruments in pursuit of a range of goals. So here's how I think the progressive dilemma can be resolved. The ECB's economy shaping activities in the financial market, in the labor market, and so on are not bad. The problem is that this economy shaping is too important to be a mere support function of monetary policy implementation. One does not have to question the central bank's dedication to the public good to question this arrangement. The central bank's economy shaping powers should be wielded, but they should be wielded according to democratic political decisions. That's it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Micha, you want to um, re um, respond to that? Um, yes, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. Um, it's, a, it's a group that I regularly don't have a chance to talk to, so I'm looking forward to the, uh, uh, to the discussion. Um, I also have three points uh, that I would like to uh, uh, talk about. Uh, first, uh, I actually agree um, with Benjamin there that central banking has always been more about um, than just simple inflation targeting or, or price stabilization, uh, but it can be also read in a good way and I'll, I'll try to make that case. Um, second, um, I also agree that there is uh, room to do more um, in the area of, uh, for example, climate change and so on. Um, but I, I would like to question uh, if uh, central banks are really best positioned to uh, make the greatest difference uh, in that area. And the last point, which I, I, I'm not going to elaborate on, uh, but I would just leave it as a, as a, as a warning here. Uh, I think it's perfectly legitimate to have a, have a discussion about the mandate of central banks uh, in, in the euro area, but mandate of the ECB. Unfortunately, the, uh, um, 
uh, legal framework is, is what it is. So uh, it's not a part of the uh, strategic uh, review. Um, it's a question best directed at, uh, at, at politicians. Uh, but I would like to warn uh, that going beyond that, uh, uh, there is nothing progressive about uh, dismantling independent institutions and uh, subjecting them to the will of the people. And I guess later today, uh, um, uh, Yulia Kirai will uh, talk about experience from Hungary, uh, where, where something of that sort has been uh, happening, uh, but um, from a different side of the uh, political, political spectrum. So let me uh, let me uh, say something about this cent uh, central banking and, and inflation targeting, and that central banking has always been more about uh, inflation. Central banks have, as Benjamin writes in the paper, always been um, um, they've done all sorts of things in, in throughout history. Um, Paul Tucker tends to talk about two broad models of central banks historically uh, uh, about subordinate agents uh, of the state or of the government. And, and independent trustees and the evolution has uh, generally been in the direction of uh, independent trustees tasked with a, a specific responsibility. Um, I have a sort of benign reading of this evolution. I, I think central banking has evolved uh, to allow central banks to concentrate on what they are reasonably good at. Um, um, and, uh, and that's uh, um, price stabilization. Um, and uh, I would also say that the fact that they focus on price stability, it, it, it doesn't mean that that's all what they uh, deliver. And um, uh, the current discussion about uh, ECB policy is, uh, involves a lot of things about side effects. Um, people tend to forget that these side effects can, um, can also be benign, can also be uh, positive. Uh, when we look at the last decade, um, attempts to get inflation back uh, up, to, uh, up to the target uh, in the context of the euro area meant basically massively supporting demand, saving jobs, saving companies, um, small and large. And, and um, yeah. we even get criticism from uh, the political right, we talk about zombification. I don't think that's a, actually a serious issue, but um, uh, keeping inefficient of companies afloat is something that uh, you know, uh, used to be directed at socialist governments in the 1970s. So uh, in a way, uh, we should be proud of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, uh, and, and seriously, uh, uh, price stability oriented monetary policy in the last decade has been an important contributor to social uh, justice and financial stability too, um, keeping the loan portfolios of uh, banks healthier and so on. This is something people uh, rarely, uh, rarely emphasize, rarely um, um, sort of are aware of, because these are sort of second round effects of what the policy is actually trying to uh, achieve. Central banking has been the only game in town uh, throughout this period, we need to say, um, and not only in the uh, in the euro area and central and, and the, the world would look a lot uglier um, if uh, central banks had not act acted as the, the way they did in the in the last uh, in the last decade. Where, where I agree with um, Benjamin, actually, uh, is that monetary policy has become more and more intrusive into the functioning of uh, markets um, in, in its attempt to uh, ensure that uh, financing conditions for households, businesses, and so on remain favorable. Um, it's not that people have not thought about this, uh, uh, not th thought through the implications of what they're doing. <clears throat> people were even aware of uh, the potential backlash it's just that um, if you're the only game in town and, and you have a clear task to deliver, you're in a kind of a trap. Uh, uh, you have to do something and, uh, um, and, and otherwise you will be held, held, held to account for, for failure to do something. Um, and so ultimately it came down to a cost benefit analysis. And I, I very much agree that um, the European system uh, should be uh, more transparent about that, and I think this is the, where we are where we are heading. Um, but again, it's also important not to look at um, individual measures taken in isolation. It's important to consider monetary policy as a package. And there, I think, um, when you look at these also side effects and and and, and consistency with uh, market neutrality, it's um, it, it tends to be uh, it tends to be more favorable. Um, Having said that, I, I see uh, um, so there is certainly room um, uh, to do more within the existing framework, and uh, we, we should definitely not rely simply on just some divine coincidence that when we uh, achieve, uh, we try to achieve price stability, we uh, happen to contribute to other goals in 
um, the society as, uh, as well. Um, there are actually elements of that in the current system. Uh, there is, for example, some flexibility around how quickly we want to infl want inflation to get back to uh, target. So it allows us to consider um, what is happening to unemployment, what is happening to um, potentially uh, financial stability or even climate change goals. There's, there's just one, uh, I think we've we should try and try and finish now that we can kind of jump into the debate because we've both already right, okay. kind of extended uh, the time. So it, the, the point is that um, the system may easily become uh, very complex, and um, and then uh, people may get confused about what the what the central banks are actually uh, actually trying to trying to achieve. Uh, one final remark: uh, there is uh, in in the paper there is a lot about how powerful uh, central banks are. Uh, uh, with regards to achieving um, uh, sort of societal goals. I actually do not think they are that powerful. The most powerful instruments are in the hands of uh, governments, and that includes uh, policies to tackle climate change. Having said that, central banks should be and could be good citizens, and, and, I, and I think there are there is an open mind about that in the, uh, in the community. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Benjamin, do you want to go uh, right back? Um, one thing that I've found interesting in your paper that hasn't been touched upon is sort of the, the architectural, um, how financial, how central banks work, how they always go via financial markets. Maybe that's something we can explore at some point. Um, yes, happy to. Um, let me just maybe respond to two important uh, think statements right away uh, in Mikhail's uh, response. Thanks very much, um, Mikhail, for uh, reading the paper and, and engaging. Um, I would like to respond to the point about central banks having been the only game in town. Um, of course, I very much agree with that. And uh, I share with most of my uh, even more critical colleagues the view that uh, it's good that central banks have filled that void. Um, and have acted as lenders of last resort in the 2008 crisis and are again doing so this year um, and have even done uh, QE. Uh, the question is why have central banks been the only game in town, uh, right? Uh, so what I tried to get at with my introductory remarks in the paper and what Daniela is describing very well in her paper is that the reason is that we have a macrofinancial architecture that decapacitates fiscal policy and public investment. And how does it do so? It does so via the Maastricht Treaty, which, for example, has a non monetary financing clause. So it is the decapacit the, the, the elimination of monetary fiscal coordination enshrined in the Maastricht Treaty that takes the central bank out of the equation when it comes to uh, fiscal policy and government debt that subjects sovereign, issue, the sovereign debt issuers, states, uh, to so-called market discipline. And then uh, central banks become the only game in town because fiscal policy is decapacitated and monetary policy has to do it all. But that is, as Daniela described, and I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, take take all her points, uh, anticipate all her points. But this is very important in this context. Monetary financing is sub subordinated monetary financing. It's geared towards financial stability, and this is a second best world. Even central bankers, even Mario Draghi, uh, even Christine Lagarde, and many others uh, have been saying, "Please, fiscal policy, do more." Uh, the problem is central bank independence itself is part of the macrofinancial regime that makes it so that fiscal policy has not been able to do more. That is not the uh, uh, um, fault of Mario Draghi or uh, Christine Lagarde. It's uh, the same cannot be said for some of the uh, technocrat architects of the Maastricht Treaty, former central bankers, um, but uh, let's not get into that. So maybe this just as as the first as a first response. And if you want, I can say a little bit more about. Maybe we can we can leave it at that for now, and then just kind of shift back over. Micha, what do you um, what do you think about that about the fiscal policy being decapacitated by the by the treaty? And um, maybe also if you want to follow in on the mandate discussion, there was a question in the chat by Renz van Tilburg um, on how you interpret interpret the the second uh, mandate of the ECB the the 
um, on achieving the economic goals of the European Union. Um, right, on, on monetary uh, financing and fiscal uh, policy. So in terms of fiscal policy, I agree that, uh, you know, uh, rules uh, that govern fiscal policy uh, are sort of ripe for a, a rethink. Um, uh, this has been slowed, this process has been slowed down repeatedly uh, for uh, political reasons. And again, this is, uh, you know, something that uh, politicians or society needs to, uh, needs to deal with. Um, when talking about uh, space for fiscal action, uh, it's not only about rules, it's also about past behavior. Uh, uh, so that needs to be uh, borne in mind as well. Um, certain uh, countries have uh, not had uh, the space that you would uh, want them to have after a, a fav fav fairly favorable couple of decades. Um, and um, we also talk about the central capacity at the EU level. So thankfully that has uh, materialized. So that, that has uh, come forth uh, last, last year. Um, there is now uh, a stimulus coming from the, uh, from the central level, which uh, perhaps uh, should, have happened, uh, should have happened earlier. Um, and, and would have supported the, uh, the recovery of the European economy and, and the central banks would not have been the um, only game in town. In, in Europe, we have a pro prohibition uh, for uh, monetary financing. Um, uh, the, uh, the Bank of England is in a peculiar position where it can sort of, sort of deploy uh, if it, uh, that, that tool if it uh, wishes to do so. Um, I mean, I would, uh, I would again, be cautious here. It, it, you know, it's a it's a very uh, sensitive element in the institutional setup. We have awful examples from around the world when things got out of hand, and we should not simply just gloss over or ignore those uh, um, examples. Um, I mean, I I'm not as sort of closed-minded on on um, central banks uh, operating directly with, uh, with 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 the wider population. Uh, but again, this needs to be uh, within the right institutional framework that provides the right incentives, including for uh, for governments. Benjamin, do you want to go right back? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I think the point about the um, examples from other parts of the world where taking away um, independence. Uh, you know, has created problems. This point I would like to address. Um, Mikhail Horvath said that there's nothing progressive about dismantling independent institutions and, and subjecting them to the will of the people. Now, uh, one could argue that that's the history of democracy uh, is to dismantle, you know, not democratically accountable institutions and replacing them with uh, accountable institutions. Some people would even argue that uh, monetary policy is a remnant of uh, such earlier periods, basically uh, the, the, the last uh, bastion uh, uh, in that regard, very much the successor of the gold standard, of course. I mean, inflation targeting historically is what replaces the Bretton Woods system, and the Bretton Woods system is what replaces the gold standard, retains the, do uh, the gold um, backing of the US dollar. And so with the en entry into a fiat, a fiat money regime, central bank independence becomes the uh, institutional fix for this. Um, central bank independence, of course, is um, a democratically decided uh, thing in, in most places. There are parliamentary decisions to institute central bank independence. Um, but I do think that there may be something progressive about uh, uh, reconsidering a policy regime that has not done so well. Uh, central banks have done well uh, being the only game in town, but everybody would have maybe done better had they not been the only game in town. And that would require monetary fiscal coordination. And that almost by definition uh, means a much lower degree of independence. Uh, because how, how else could you uh, coordinate? Um, it, we don't need to discuss the, the, the details of what, what we mean by independence, but um, every institution uh, responds to a particular historical configuration of um, macroeconomic problems and political um, uh, 
configurations and also quality of institutions, of course. It, it, it makes no sense uh, in my view to uh, cite the worst cases of, um, let's say institutional breakdown uh, as arguments against um, making the most independent central bank in the world, the ECB, in um, a context uh, of generally, you know, highly developed political institutions and mechanisms, a little less independent. It's, I think. I'll uh, just quickly uh, respond to that. I'm, I'm surprised to have this discussion in an environment with negative long-term interest rates and with in, a, in an environment with. Uh, where basically the uh, central bank is uh, has, has committed itself to uh, uh, purchasing an, uh, a huge amount of uh, government securities, uh, um, which potentially actually aren't there in in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, governments are in uh, in a in a in a wonderful position to address a lot of the um, social and environmental ills uh, of the of the society and and. The bank has has created extremely favorable conditions for for doing it right now, and for the foreseeable future. Um, so uh, instead of discussing, you know, uh, institutional dismantling, we should be uh, sort of discussing how um, how to how to basically get governments to do something about um, the key issues that we face as a society. No objections to that, um, but of course, this is now, and this happens at the discretion of uh, the same independent actors that uh, were a part of the Troika under the same macro financial regime uh, only a few years ago. Um, and governments, many governments in the Euro area were not in a great position to do uh, very much for the health uh, of their citizens. The, the public health uh, consequences of uh, macroeconomic adjustment programs, I think, have been thoroughly studied in recent years by uh, by researchers. Maybe I can throw something in um, real quick. So, at the on, on the panel on Wednesday, Adam Tooze was sort of kind of framing the discussion in a similar way. We're saying on the on the one hand, you have sort of this this classic mandate of central bank independence, and and um, and, and it's clear that you're only supposed to, or in the ECB especially, only you're supposed to do very few things. And on the other hand, um, in this ne what we're calling this next generation central banking, and we have all these societal challenges such as inequality and climate change. Um, what else can you uh, could you do? And maybe it's uh, maybe these kind of historical situations that we're in right now require a, a all hands on deck um, kind of approach. So I understand, uh, of course, Michal, that you can't um, personally go beyond the the treaty, but um, maybe there are certain things that are are in the treaty already. That was another question or in the, in the chat again uh, that you could do where you could do more on um, societal challenges. Uh, maybe that's something that you can explore a little bit, especially specifically like climate change or inequality, there are things that you can do where you target monetary policy a little more directly um, and thereby possibly increase um, the effect it has on price stability and not uh, go through financial markets where often the, the money kind of dries up. I um, would be interested to hear your thoughts briefly on that and then I think we have to come to an end. Um, yes, on, on, um, on, on climate change uh, specifically, I, I, I think there is a, there's a lot of talk about how uh, um, central banks should uh, adapt their um, investment strategy, their um, uh, even the way they implement monetary policy um, to to make it more sort of greener, uh, uh, climate friendly. And I'm uh, again, I'm uh, I'm open to that. I'm just not sure how much of a difference that is going to make. Obviously, if only central banks do something about it, it, it is going to uh, make a difference. But the uh, the potential on the government side, uh, you know, to uh, introduce proper taxation, uh, to introduce regulation, uh, actually create markets for uh, sort of uh, green securities and, 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 and so on, um, um, you know, that they like it has created markets for uh, emissions and so on. The, the, the potential there and the, and the toolkit is just so much, uh, so much wider. If you, if, you, if you think about this in the context of, for example, social policy, imagine there would be no social insurance at all in the, in the country. And now the central bank would be asked to uh, sort of uh, give preferential treatment to some assets of uh, employee, employers who, uh, for example, provide sickness pay or who provide retirement 
benefits or who provide some unemployment benefits and they would have an army of people employed to sort of value the sort of social value of that additional uh, thing that the, the firms would do. I mean, of course, if there was nothing else, this would make a difference, but we have big public social safety nets and social insurance system exactly because they are the tools. And then, and then the central bank can just uh, you know, go to the market and buy securities whose value depends on the after-tax revenue stream attached to those uh, assets. And in that, in that sense, uh, you know, uh, that, that works perfectly well in the area of social policy um, uh, on top of that central banks, as I said, okay. might continue to contribute well, but um, it could work in a similar way in, uh, in, um, in, in climate change as well. Yeah, Benjamin, do you uh, any any last thoughts on that before we uh, jump into the next debate? Yes, just very briefly. Um, um, I I would object uh, uh, to. I I think we're think, uh, talking about different scales of intervention. Uh, I don't I don't think that the climate crisis can be addressed uh, by measures such as uh, subsidizing slightly uh, certain. Um, firms over others, there will have to be a degree of what one might call capital coercion by the state. Um, in order to be able to do that, a state must be uh, able, for example, to prevent uh, capital flight from happening. In order to be able to do that, it needs to be able to take measures uh, uh, that will require central bank support because private investment will have to be replaced by public investment, for example, uh, in order to you know, limit the capacity for capital fight and so on. And that's the, the kind of uh, rearrangement of, macro of the macro financial architecture and the role of the central bank that I've tried uh, to yeah, get at. Yeah, I think that's it's very clear from from the positioning that um, obviously we we are in in a world where we are right now with the framework that we're in right now, and that's sort of the rules that are followed by the practitioners uh, in a way. And then there's also something that we that um, can be explored if we look at all these challenges that we have at hand right now, where we really need to uh, rethink um, maybe what central banks are doing. But and, and there is pros and cons for that. So thank you very very much um, for this debate, uh, Michal and uh, Benjamin.